Hello and welcome back to Weather or Not. Today I'm your host, Kyle Eck, joined by our forecaster of the week, Connor Friedhoff. Now, Connor, it's finally spring equinox. The temperatures are increasing. Do we stay warm through the weekend? Well, not to the weekend. We're going to be seeing more rain to start this, our first spring weekend, especially on Friday and Saturday. It's going to be an absolute soaker. But on Sunday, we'll see a bit more wind, but a relief from the rain. Sure, I love to hear it saying that we're we not seeing snow this weekend. Now, Connor, just to transition, we have some very interesting nature in the news stories. What are yours? Absolutely. I have two stories, one on how people are moving to the upper Midwest to escape the effects of climate change, as well as the aftermath of all those atmospheric rivers over in California. How about you? Sure. So I'll be covering the aftermath of the nor'easter that impacted New England and the interior northeast back over Pi Day, as well as the Cherry Blossom Bloom Festival, not just he around here in D.C., but across the pond over in Tokyo, Japan. Oh, we've got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about this week. Of course. And with that, let's get into nature and the news. An onslaught of atmospheric rivers and storms have saturated California. But what has this done for their year-long drought? The 2023 winter season has been skyrocketing past averages, effectively matching the last three years of precipitation combined. Though the drought may have faltered slightly in the last few months, this doesn't erase the immediate effects of this extended period of rain and snowfall. Many remain without power after widespread flooding and the occasional levee breach. And although local reservoirs and mountain snowpacks have been replenished to near average levels, many remain concerned about the state's unsustainable water use. Increases in average temperature have made drought and fire season longer and more dangerous. California's water resource management has adapted to a warmer climate in recent years. Numerous irrigation networks and reservoirs seek to bridge the gaps between extended periods of precipitation, essentially stretching out water resources. In some cases, so much water is collected that controlled releases are performed to decrease the risk of floods. In the mountains, snowpack is at a 30-year high, with statewide averages topping 50 inches measured. Snowmelt in the later seasons helps to replenish water resources, but faster rates of melting could disrupt this routine. California finally has some relief in their water troubles, but more will need to be done in order to ensure water security for the millions of residents. A warm start to March has led to record-tying early cherry blossom blooming in Tokyo on March 14th. This year, cherry blossoms have begun blooming 10 days ahead of schedule a feat only achieved before in 2020 and 2021. The warmth and the early blooms are treating both locals and tourists to amazing views. In fact, with easing COVID-19 restrictions across Japan, this is the first year since before 2020 that public gathering to view cherry blossoms are widely accepted. It's not just Tokyo, however, that's been getting in on this cherry blossom blooming, as Washington, D.C. is also currently seeing peak cherry blossom blooming thanks to above average temperatures. In no time, pollen season will take shape as the weather continues to warm throughout spring. As climate change continues to uproot the lives of millions, new solutions have seemingly cropped up nationwide. More and more people are making the life-changing decision to move to safer climates. Some regions in the United States have been referred to as climate refuges, offering mild conditions and safety from rising temperatures and sea level. In terms of cities seeing growth due to climate migration, many fall in the upper Midwest. Their landlocked status, along with lower temperatures, offer relief from a warming world. One of these cities, Duluth, Minnesota, has become quite the destination for those mitigating their personal climate risks. The moves have seen property values rise and local housing markets become viciously competitive. Many movers are from the American Southwest, where wildfire seasons continue to worsen. Yet many new residents fail to factor in the lower amount of sunshine in the other end of the country. There's no place on the globe that's impervious to climate change, but that doesn't seem to stop many from seeking the best possible environments for their families. Less than one week before spring equinox, Mother Nature gave many residents in the Northeast a wake-up call to not put away their snowblowers just yet. On the 30th anniversary of the storm of the century, a powerful nor'easter dumped feet of snow over parts of New England. Heavy, wet snow created hazardous travel conditions for millions along the I-95 corridor in the interior northeast. Beacon, New York, picked up an impressive 43 inches of snow. 45 to 50 plus mile per hour winds brought down trees, causing damage in inland Massachusetts. Along the coast in situate Massachusetts, storm surge and high winds both worked to knock out power for thousands of customers. 
the Mid-Atlantic was also not able to escape the gale force winds, as Atlantic City and Baltimore experienced over 50 mile per hour wind gusts. For New England snow lovers, this nor'easter has been able to chip away at their seasonal snowfall deficit. don't have any outdoor plans this weekend it's not going to be the ideal time for it as it's going to be quite rainy friday we start out we have the storm system making its way through low pressure system in virginia going to cause quite the soaker throughout the ohio valley and the mid-atlantic region the whole state aside from just the extreme northern part of pennsylvania getting absolutely washed out by rain this continues over here in the new jersey as well as the new york metro dc metro philadelphia pretty much all the northeast corridor and that continues on into Saturday, but this time the rain stretches all the way up past upstate New York into New England. Another storm system makes its way through, occluding and just dumping rain uh, all throughout the region here. Almost the entire map is covered in rain. Everywhere south of here, of course, with that warm air from the Gulf, it's going to be quite humid. Some places in Virginia and North Carolina could see temperatures up into the 80s. It's going to feel more like June for those folks. But, of course, north of the front, it's going to be fairly cold, especially up in upper Canada and parts of New York and Pennsylvania. Sunday, high pressure system is going to be hanging out in eastern Kentucky, pretty much pushing away everything that would be a nuisance to us, but still going to be fairly cloudy in the northern parts of the state as the storm system makes its exit going out into the Atlantic, but it's going to dump a little bit more rain in New England and some snow in far north Maine for our area. Friday, 49 degrees. That rain is going to be persistent all weekend. It's going to be quite a soaker, and it could cause some flood threats in low-lying areas. Of course, turn around and don't drown if you need to get somewhere. Friday night, the temperature dips down into the upper 30s. It was that annoying cold rain and it can be potentially dangerous if you're outside for an extended period of time at night with how cold it's going to be and, of course, with exposure to rain. Saturday, this continues. Temperatures get up to the 50s in some spots, but you won't really feel it with how cold it is and with the rain, and that's going to continue into the evening. I sound like a broken record at this rate with the amount of rain that we're getting, so accumulations could be upwards of one to one and a half inches, maybe two in some spots as the temperature dips back down to the 30s and we get a little bit of a breeze in some spots. Sunday, just a few clouds here and there, be a little bit windy, but we bounce back up into the mid 50s, a little bit above average. It's going to be a picturesque Sunday. Not quite gonna make up for Friday and Saturday, but a nice way to end the weekend. And our very own David Guerrero has a feature on tornadoes and topography. Stay tuned. Tornadoes are one of the most fascinating yet scary phenomenons in our nature. They typically occur in the southern and central portions of the United States, where terrain is relatively flat. However, can they form over hills and mountains? Let's find out together. As a violent rotating column of air that extends from a thunderstorm to the ground, tornadoes can cause significant damage to buildings, trees, and infrastructure, and they can be deadly to those caught in their path. Tornado formation is a complex process that requires specific atmospheric conditions. In general, tornadoes forms in areas where they clash between warm, moist air and cool, dry air. This often occurs in central and southern regions of the United States, where warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico meets cool, dry air from the north. However, they can also occur in areas such as the northeast region of the United States under specific weather conditions. The first stage in tornado formation is the development of a rotating thunderstorm. This is caused by a change in wind direction and speed with height known as wind shear. As the storm grows in size and strength, the updraft within the storm can begin to rotate. This creates a mesocyclone, which is a rotating column of air several miles in diameter. As the mesocyclone continues to rotate, it can begin to draw in warm, moist air from the surrounding environment. This causes the air within the mesocyclone to rise rapidly, which can lead to a formation of a funnel cloud. A funnel cloud is a rotating column of air that extends from the base of the cloud towards the ground. If the funnel cloud reaches the ground, it becomes a tornado. Typically, tornadoes form over flat surfaces. However, can they survive hills and mountains? To attain this answer, I spoke with one of the leading researchers on tornado formation, Dr. Paul Markowski. So I think the simplest way of looking at it is that the thunderstorm that spawns the tornado is approximately a thousand 
cubic miles in volume, if you think of it as a 10 by 10 by 10 mile dimension cube. So really the underlying terrain is pretty insignificant when you think of it in those terms. So uh, terrain certainly does have an impact on tornadoes, uh, both how they form and, and once they are formed. Unfortunately, it's impossible to generalize what the effect would be. So sometimes terrain is, could probably disrupt the process. In some cases, it probably enhances the process and it really depends on the vagaries, the particular terrain feature you're looking at, whether there's a valley maybe that channels flow or a hill that has airflow accelerating over it or decelerating on the upslope side. Um, there's almost an unlimited number of permutations that are possible. While it is extremely difficult to analyze the specific effects that topography has on a past tornado, Professor Markowski explains how he studies the influence of terrain on tornado formation. We can simulate that though in, in computer simulations. It's kind of what we do in our field. It's akin to a laboratory experiment where you have a control that you compare the experiment to. So in a simulation, we can remove all of the terrain and just have flat ground. We can simulate that storm and then compare it to another simulation that has whatever terrain feature we want to study. But in real life, you can't do that. You don't have that luxury, unfortunately. As I mentioned earlier, tornadoes and their formation is a highly complex process that contains multiple variables. Terrain can influence those variables in either a positive or a negative way. While it is impossible to know the effects that the topography had on a past tornado, we do know that tornadoes can occur over mountains and hills and may even help their development. For Weather or Not, I'm David Guerrero. weekend does not look so bright, unfortunately, but what does that mean for next week? Let's get right into that extended forecast. Starting out with our weekend recap, Friday and Saturday are an absolute washout. Temperatures hovering around that 50 mark for pretty much the entire weekend until we get to Sunday. We do rebound both weather-wise and temperature-wise, a high of 54 and some sun making an appearance, making it a little bit less gloomy of a weekend with that rebound on Sunday. Looking into next week, a bit of a pendulum of weather starting and ending the work week with some rain. However, Monday, we do see those temperatures start to dip below average, and that's going to stick around for both Tuesday and Wednesday. Some sun on Wednesday, but not going to be too much with those temperatures hovering around the 50 mark. Thursday and Friday, clouds return and some rain showers are possible on Friday. So before we get to April, we're going to have a few things to get through before. Thank you so much for your extended forecast, Connor. Now it's time for our Weather Whiz Quiz question of the week. This week's question is, what is the highest temperature ever recorded in Pennsylvania in March? Is it A, 82 degrees Fahrenheit? Is it B, 87 degrees Fahrenheit? Is it C, 92 degrees Fahrenheit? Or is it D, 97 degrees Fahrenheit? Today, if you answered C, 92 degrees Fahrenheit, you would be correct. It's really interesting, Connor, to see that 92 degrees was our monthly record here across the state in March. That's crazy. That had to be an intense high-pressure system combined with some you know, robust movement of tropical air northwards for that to happen. Sure, and with some food for thought, for that record was set over 110 years ago. That's incredible. I mean, that record has been here the whole time. Some things have probably come close to it, but as it stands, it's still here today. Yeah, luckily we won't be seeing those types of temperatures anytime soon. <laughs> well, we thank you so much for tuning in to this week's edition of Weather or Not. Make sure you tune in next week for another jam-packed session of our show. Before that, though, have a great week.